And there it goes. Welcome, everybody, to the rise of the spacefaring nations. This is a webinar from Space and Satellite Professionals International. If you go to the next slide, please. I'm uh, Robert Bell. I'm executive director of the World Satellite of the World, the World Satellite. Well, I guess we're, we liked it so much, we're going to see it again, eh? Okay, that's great. There we go. This is our webinar on the rise of the spacefaring nations. Now, this is not just a webinar all by itself. This is actually part of a multi-platform uh, campaign we've been running now for, for four weeks uh, called Opening the Final Frontier. And if you go, and you'll be hearing more about that in just a moment. If you go to the next slide, please. For those who may not be familiar with SSPI or as familiar as we wish they were, uh, just a couple of quick, quick, points about us. We are the largest, most international, and most cross-disciplinary network in this industry, which encompasses not just the traditional satellite business, but the rapidly expanding space business around it. And our membership ranges from new hires to very seasoned executives, from startups that are still on the launch pad, as well as some of the mature businesses in our, in our industry, which are, have billions and billions of revenue. Whatever they are, they are the engine of innovation today, as well as the disruption and the experimentation that is sweeping the industry and making all of our lives extremely interesting, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse, but always with a lot of excitement. Next slide. So in addition to that network, which started out back in 1983 and is now some 3,000 people strong, SSPI helps this entire industry to attract, to develop, and to retain talented people to keep that engine of innovation turning. And we do, it, of course, first through this network that exists, through which people interact, uh, but also by challenging their ambitions and offering them opportunities to grow in their careers in, a, in quite a large number of ways, which you can learn more about at our website. Next slide. And finally, we promote the enormous value of space through dramatic stories. We're storytellers, evangelists, actually, we've been called for the space industry. Uh, and so these stories we tell through dramatic short videos are designed to inspire the people of our industry to keep going, also to attract new talent, particularly that young new talent that wants to work in an industry that makes a difference. That's, a, that's a, something that we can certainly provide in our business. It also helps justify the current investments as well as attracting new investors into the field. And it's very important to remember that despite the success of fundraising, it's, it's increased by a factor of of uh, from almost zero to 14 billion over 10 years is still just a tiny slice of total investment that goes from all sources. And so there's lots of room for more. Gives potential customers and reason to care about our products and services, right? We, this has been a niche industry for so long and the customers we have know us very well, but there's a set of customers out there that we need. And until they know we exist, they can, can't buy from us. And finally, all of this adds up to inspiring the growth of this this uh, projected trillion dollar space economy of the future. That's probably, number is probably low actually these days, but it's the one that uh, has been put forward by I think it was McKinsey, but it could have been another one of the another one of the uh, the big consulting shops. So onward. Um, next slide, please. Our topic today is opening the final frontier. Uh, so far over the past four weeks, we've been doing a lot. Uh, regular podcasts every week, uh, including interviews with Virgin Orbit COO Tony Gingas, uh, the chief engineer from Momentus, Nathan Orr, Steve Kaufman, well known from Hogan Lovells, as well as Adrian Guzman of the Mexican Space Agency, and Spaceport Cornwall's Melissa Thorpe and the Greater Houston Partnership's Kevin Tipton, opening our eyes to the economic development opportunities here on Earth that arise from uh, space. Following that, uh, about a week and a half ago, I believe, was uh, our regular New York Space Business Roundtable session, a live event like this, which focused on the cislunar economy, the next great frontier for development uh, in our industry. Today, we're talking about the rise of the spacefaring nations, and then coming soon to finish off our campaign will be an issue of our digital magazine, The Orbiter, dedicated to this issue of the final frontier. Next slide, please. It's my great pleasure to thank Virgin Orbit for being the financial underwriter of this campaign. Without the kind of the support from companies like that, we really can't do this work. Uh, as you can see, it's a very active campaign. And so just a moment of thanks for Virgin Orbit and also a moment to catch up with what they've been doing recently in, the, in London. Next slide. <laughs> i 
this year. I keep it moving, steady, standing still. I'm like a man on a mission, called eternal vision. We go where they will. I'm seeing stars in the mirror. I got a feeling the dust won't quit. I actually pinch myself every morning. We're just so fortunate to be involved in a number of really exciting projects. Europe uh, has never put a satellite into space. And the wonderful thing about using a Virgin Atlantic 747 is that we can fly to any country and, and we can put satellites into space. And we can do it at a moment's notice. It's just great that, you know, that Great Britain is the first country in Europe uh, to, to be putting satellites into space. Great video. Okay, a couple of housekeeping notes. As Tamara Bond said to those of us who were, who were joining us early, the you will be in audio, it's in a listen-only mode during this, but we do very much want to include your comments, your questions, and your ideas in this session. So you can use that chat function in Zoom. It's probably familiar to you from months and months and months of Zooming to submit questions and comments. We'll be keeping an eye on them here, and uh, I'll be doing my best to bring them into our conversation. And finally, an on-demand version of this webinar will be available at uh, www.sspi.org. I believe you'll receive an email directing you to that after this event once that, uh, that archive is ready. So, next slide, please. We've got some very, very interesting people to talk about this very interesting topic. Uh, the first of them is Steve Isley who's the Vice President for Business Development at Virgin Orbit. He, uh, in addition to him, we have Nagar Ferrer, who is the Chief Revenue Officer from a company called Space Ride, that you're gonna be hearing a, a great deal more about, I suspect, in the future. And finally, Steve Wolf, who is the Deputy Executive Director of the Global Spaceport Alliance, which is just what it sounds like. It's a new association dedicated to something that didn't exist, well, existed for a long time, but there are only a couple of them in the world, spaceports and now we're moving into a whole nother world so i wonder i'd like to ask um, if you'd be kind enough to stop sharing so we can see see the faces of our speakers properly and my first question goes I, goes to um steve isley um of virgin virgin orbit um steve this you know the the fact is that horizontal launch has played only really a very small role in the satellite business before virgin orbit decided to to take flight so why is the company make? I've been dying to ask this question to Virgin Orbit for so long. Why is the company making this big bet right now? Uh, you know, if this on this approach that's established, but it's got a long way to go in terms of development. Absolutely. So first off, pleasure to be here um, and see familiar faces. And uh, Nagar and I have worked a long time together, so it's good to see you uh, remotely. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know. Our, our, obviously, we, we took on Air Launch uh, as a way to discriminate in the market and really offer a different service that vertical launch providers uh, can't provide. And namely, it's, it really comes down to flexibility and portability. So flexible, we can hit any orbit inclination by flying the aircraft, the Boeing 747-400, to the azimuth and drop point, if you will, um, and deploy satellites exactly to the orbit they need to go to. Um, we have the flexibility to... Uh, overpass a lot of inclement weather type situations that would otherwise ground launch vehicles. Um, we have the flexibility to be incredibly responsive. And so what we deem responsive space is anything within a launch capability within 24 to 72 hours from call up. And due to the air launch nature of, I mean, due to air launch and the ability just to have a very low footprint, uh, we just need an apron, uh, we have mobile ground support equipment um connecting fueling and going you know is is a matter of eight to ten hours really in terms of once we're fully operational so um the quick turnaround the cadence the flexibility and the ability to um really be able to provide a tailored customized service to customers small satellite community in particular um is is really where uh, we stand out and then that flexibility allows us to be mobile and that means we can we are a global launch provider so we don't stay stationary and have satellites come to us. Uh, we can come to you and we can also create spacefaring nations and we can help build up their ecosystem uh, by having launch. And that's usually the final missing puzzle piece. I mean, there aren't that many launch nations. And so by offering that service, 
we believe we can help stimulate the ecosystems and help build up uh, space uh, capabilities around the world. And so that's really uh, what we're about, uh, why we're, you know, growing internationally, why we're doing so many spaceports, like you saw the imagery from the UK, which was a great day. And, and then that upcoming launch will be that first kind of proof point where we actually have the blueprint of launching internationally. So that's what Virgin Orbit's about. And uh, we think that there's a real future there in the market uh, to grow internationally. Well, thank you. Um, I'm curious now, I've had conversations with a couple of spaceport um, operators in the past, but how do you expect a successful launch, horizontal launch business, to really change the business equation for spaceport developers like, for instance, Steve Wolf's members? Well, for starters, um, uh, you know, we have a very light footprint, as I mentioned up top. And I think um, for spaceports, I, I think a real key is uh, to be able to have you know, uh, short milestones and to turn around and launch quickly. I think if you if it takes too long because you have to develop the footprint, you have to set up launch pads, you may have to build a spaceport from scratch, which many places are doing, figure out the regulatory environment, then you drag things out. And, and as we know, I mean, you can lose interest from investors, from the, from the politicians, uh, uh, from the region. And uh, with air launch, you have a kit. I mean, you basically have a spaceport kit um, it can utilize existing infrastructures. So we just need an airport that has a runway that can accommodate 747. Um, and that infrastructure, uh, the basic infrastructure means that we can come in, we could do a one-off demo mission, um, we could do a campaign, or we could have a more permanent infrastructure like we do in the UK, where we actually leave the ground support equipment in place and country uh, to help mobilize um, in a faster manner. And so I think the horizontal launch really provides kind of that that frankly that that go nexus in a much shorter time frame than you would if you have to build up the infrastructure and with vertical launch systems it's just not inherently as mobile and, and it doesn't mean that you can't have vertical launch of course at international spaceports i mean countries are building their own small rockets and some rocket providers may be able to ship overseas but our system is it's turnkey it's ready to go uh future variations will feature uh, a 747 cargo uh, version that will have that will be able to transport all the ground support equipment as well as the rocket in the fuselage of the plane. I mean, so you just have a flying launch pad. It takes off from one runway, it lands at another runway, it empties out the contents of the ground support equipment, and within 24 hours, you're up and rolling. So that's really where I think air launch uh, is a difference maker in this industry, and will kickstart things much faster than you would, I think, in your traditional launch scenario. Spaceport in a box. <clears throat> There's some words to remember. Um, let us, if, uh, in terms of our slides, if you could uh, share again and advance to our next slide, introduce before our next speaker. UK has had a space industry, you know, especially on the small satellite side, they've, they've been a leader in that area and they've, they've been participants in all of the European space programs all along. But bringing launch to that country for the first time is changing the way people look at space. Okay, well, we got a little flavor of it right there. Uh, let's turn to the gentleman who knows more about it than, uh, than we learned in our 30 seconds there, Steve Wolf. Why don't you tell us about the Global Spaceport Alliance? And what I'm particularly interested in, again, is a timing issue. You know, what, what's the opportunity that you and your members see which makes this the right moment to get, the, or it's already established, but this is the right moment to really get this off the ground and make it grow? Oh. He's muted. Well, actually, I'm not, but let's see here. Uh, there it is. I got it now. Okay. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Robert. Uh, uh, Stephen, that was an excellent uh, presentation. Um, and love the video, by the way. We, uh, the Beyond, uh, the, um, the Global Spaceport Alliance has, uh, let me see. Yeah, so the Global Spaceport Alliance, you know, we've actually, you said we're new, but we've actually been around for about eight years now believe it or not. And we uh, uh, really early on, uh, we 
we held a meeting, a summit meeting of spaceport operators from around the country and a few, a few international. And that's really how we've evolved over, over these years. We started out with about 14 people in a meeting in Houston, and now we're up to 75 folks. We have 48 members, 27 of those are spaceports from around the world. Nine of those are international, including of course, Cornwall Wall. Uh, congratulations, Stephen, for your upcoming launch. Uh, I think it is an important fact that this is the first time that the UK will be launching from their soil into space. Uh, and that will not be the first of its kind. We anticipate other nations will be stepping into the fray as well. Um, it's interesting that there's not just one spaceport, but there are four space spaceports in development in the UK. Um, and I was just on a phone this week with a, a spaceport uh, proposal in Ireland. So what's what you're seeing is this this growth of interest of of municipalities, nations wanting to join in this this great evolution that's taking place right now in the whole. Uh, space community, whether it's government-led or commercial-led, um, and uh, and and uh, and the global the GSA is doing what it can to help support the growth and stimulate that that uh, that sector. Um, so we are uh, we're, we're very excited about that. We've been um, we look forward to our next um, our next uh, gathering, which is our our summit event, which will be on February twentieth in uh, Orlando, Florida. And uh, we look forward to that. Um, the uh, is that is is that get to uh, your question, Robert? Yeah. You're on mute, Robert. We can't hear you. For some reason, my computer decided that it was smarter than I am. How are you, how are you guys doing? Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you, almost, you almost answered the question, Steve, um, which is really, you know, why now? Because one of the mm -hmm. things that, that gets that leaps out of me is, you know, we, we're still in the early stages of this thing. We've got Virgin's launch, done a couple of launches. We've got, you know, some rocket companies that are saying they're going to do this. And there, there's a lot of ferment around it, but it's not happening yet really so why you know why is this the right moment to get out there ahead of it ahead of what you hope well, to be a huge threat yeah no a good question i think that the evolution of this actually started with with virgin um uh, over 10 years ago when they announced the virgin galactic and their intention to create an air launched vehicle uh that was going to give rides uh to uh, you know, certainly to space tourists, but also to industry or to folks of all kinds. And I think that particularly in the United States generated a lot of interest in creating commercial spaceports. And that's why you saw, uh, you saw uh, the, the Houston spaceport, the Camden spaceport, there's a spaceport in development in, uh, in, in Titusville, Florida, uh, uh, you know, Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, there's this this excitement about the potential for being being a place for people to go to to launch, uh, and then of course you know the uh, 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 Virgin committed to New Mexico to developing Spaceport America, so it just created this it created this opportunity. Now there's been a bit of a delay, so we've seen sort of this this ramping up and a sort of a somewhat of a plateauing out, but in the meantime you know we we see we, we're witnessing all sorts of new entrants, and I know we're going to speak to to, to uh, Nagar in a minute. And she's going to talk about her entrance into this, but other launch industry, uh, other launch uh, uh, companies are entering into this marketplace, which is creating additional potential for 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 spaceports to play a big role around the world. Um, the uh, I mean, a couple of factors coming in: the cost of entry to becoming a space facility or a space nation is coming down because of caught the price of 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 of, uh, of launch is coming down um the component parts are coming down so people are seeing nations are seeing that we don't need we don't need 10 20 30 billion dollars to, to host the space program we could do it 
for a much, much uh, lower entry point. So there's just so it's just creating so much interest around the world. Whether or not a country wants to specifically have their own spaceport or not, and some of them are choosing not to have a spaceport because they can get launch capability uh, in, in a wide variety of ways from a wide variety of countries and so forth. So maybe they'll go to then maybe they'll go to Cornwall and say, well, you know, maybe maybe a European country or, or will go to Cornwall to say, can you launch our satellites for us and that sort of thing. So there's it, it, it's just and, and the, the entrepreneurial uh, dimension to this is enormous. Uh, the you know, we talk about small sats, meaning the, the, the capabilities that, you know, satellites are getting smaller and smaller and more and more capable. Right, so it's uh, just like the cell phone, right? Remember the brick cell phone we had? Well, now and now you you got tiny tiny cell phones, and so this just just evolution um, is taking place, and and we're kind of reaching the the bend in the curve, if you will, in terms of um, in terms of this interest in developing this, the the whole the whole burgeoning space economy. And we're having the same problem again, Robert. While we're waiting for for Robert, you know, I, I I do like to mention that George Whitesides was um, who's the chairman of Virgin Galactic, uh, uh, yeah, Virgin Galactic. Uh, you know, he, uh, you know, he he was he uh, uh, you know was was involved and in, in, in helped to um, you know develop this this entire entire sector. So I think uh, you know mentioning him is worthwhile. Are you there, Robert? Can you hear me now? Yeah. And my computer, is, my computer is really having, giving me a good time today. Let us, um, I just want to, want to ask you one quick more follow-up question, Steve, which is, you know, airports serve as economic development hubs. That's really, really well known. And they do it based on providing access and, of course, but achieving volume. You know, we all know that small airports are really disadvantaged right now in the States and elsewhere, as opposed to hubs. So... How is that dynamic going to play for spaceports? How do they design their economic model so that they can, you know, because they're never going to launch as frequently as, well, I shouldn't say that. In the foreseeable future, they're not going to launch as, as frequently as a standard uh, air, airport would. Mm -hmm. What are you hearing from your members about that? Yeah, no, that's an ongoing issue. You know, we're, we're, we're very interested in how, how spaceports can uh, derive revenues in a di other than uh, other than for launch, right? So, so, so it's a diversification question then. So it is a diversification question, um, and you have some spaceports like Houston is a great example. Houston Air, Air and Space Spaceport um, is uh, create, creating this this uh, space economic hub where they uh, they have uh, tenant customers like Axiom Space and other and uh, intuitive. Machines. These are mm -hmm. major space companies that now are, are saying that, that now are co-locating at that facility, and so if they and they also uh, uh, that in that area they're also creating opportunities for uh, uh, startup accelerators, you know, for, uh, that are focused on space technology. So um, this is kind of a model that's being that we're seeing repeated in different ways. Um, well, or, you know, or, and, and the, great, the great thing about it, Stephen, I'm sorry to cut you off. I just want to keep us moving. Um, you know, the great thing about it is that we that model works. There's a thing called the Aerotropolis in airports, which is exactly that. You just build a whole lot of economic development opportunities around it. So um, good. Good answer, because that's really important for a lot of people to, if they're going to get excited about this, they want to know what has legs. So, Nagar, we've been keeping you waiting for a very long time, but I'm going to keep you waiting for another 60 seconds.
So I was glad to see the maple leaf flag there. You know, my friends in Canada, they're second only to the United States and liking to wave their flag. It's great. Um, Negar, now, the reason I left you for last is because if space ride succeeds the way that I certainly hope it does, it's going to change what we mean by spacefaring, right? So tell me what your, you know, what the company's plans are and where they stand today. Okay. Uh, thank you um, for having me, Robert. And um, actually, um, I wanted to start by going back to a point that Steve made earlier about why now, like what what's so special about you know 2022 and why why do we need these type of you know airborne launch systems now and you know what's enabling that and I wanted to say that um, basically technological advancements are one reason that have enabled the space economy that we see today that's flourishing and that's growing, you know, um, exponentially. And part of that is because of autonomy and AI that we've been able to develop thanks to software and algorithms that we've we've learned. And those are some of the tools that at SpaceRide we are using in order to enable balloon launched rockets, as you saw in our video, which I had actually never seen that compilation before. I was very excited to see that. <laughs> um, is, is essential because, you know, people in the past had tried to launch uh, raccoons, as they used to call it, you know, rockets off of balloons, but it was really hard for them to succeed because they didn't have the AI and autonomous controls capabilities that we have today. I mean, look at the advancements in autonomous cars. You know, I, I drive a Tesla around and I've been driving it for like five years and I'm so thankful to the autopilot and the fact that I can just like sit back, relax, and you know, the car does everything. Um, this type of technology did not exist 10 years ago, 20 years ago that we could implement in space. And, and that's why, you know, now is the time and that's why Space Ride is here today and why, you know, we're flourishing. In terms of what we did do or planning to do, is we're developing this big rocket network in space, similar to you know Uber or FedEx um, that we have terrestrially here that we use for transporting things. We want to establish that same in space transportation system, um, and the way we do it is we're building out this network of rockets with every single launch that we do. The way our launches work is you know we go up in a stratospheric balloon, we go to around hundred thousand feet, equivalent to thirty kilometers. And we drop our rocket there. It's a multi-stage um, hybrid rocket. We do it very sustainably. We go above the ozone layer. We don't emit any particles into the ozone layer. Um, we can go higher than the you know any aircraft can operate. So um, that's where we release our rocket, and then we use this um, rocket to get our upper stages to space. And then. We don't want to basically, because one of our values is sustainability, we don't want to leave those upper stages in space and create all this debris field. So we've designed them from day one to be reusable. And with every single launch we do, we're basically adding another node into this rocket network that will enable us to have something like Uber in space in a few years. And we truly believe in about, you know, by 2026, 2027, we will have 50 of these there that you can host payloads on, you can use to transport yourself from Earth to the moon and anywhere in between. Um, and the best part about it is that you can launch from anywhere, like what we were talking about here, enabling you to have spacefaring nations, more than just the seven to 10 that we have today, from anywhere. And it's like Steve was saying, the logistics are just so simple. Like we can transport the balloon anywhere we want. We don't need a launch pad. We don't need all the infrastructure. Go up from anywhere and, and launch. Um, and cherry on top, it's super cheap because we reuse everything. So we can do a dedicated launch at only $250,000. And this is not, I'm not kidding. You can launch a 25 kilogram payload for only $250,000. And our maximum launch cost is $1 million and it's only 10K per kilogram, anywhere in between. Um, so yeah, we're taking people to the moon and beyond. And I'm very excited to be here today and you know, talk about the importance of Sovereign Launch and how we're all enabling it. And excited that Steve's here, or Steve's. Um, I was gonna say, we got Steve's here, yeah.
Um, so if you're really successful, which we certainly hope you will be, are you going to start, is this going to start uh, reducing the demand for launches from, from Earth if you've got your taxis or your Ubers running around all over in orbit? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, I think it's going to have the exact opposite effect. Um, just like on Earth, we need multiple different transportation modes. Some people prefer to take the train. Some people to prefer to take the bus and others want to take a limo or a taxi or an Uber or drive their own car. We need the exact same, not exact same type of structure, but we need the diversity of transportation systems in order for the space economy to flourish. And I think even today, space transportation is still a problem. A lot of people might say, oh, that space transport problem is solved now. We have Falcon 9s, they go up all the time, you know, done. It's absolutely not the case. That's like me saying here on Earth, oh, we have the Greyhound bus. Who needs anything else? Just hop on the bus and go to wherever you want to go and then, you know, walk 10 miles till you get there. So it's the same thing in space. And once we actually put our rocket network in space, that's going to enable more people to want to go into space. So it's going to just build more business for Steve at Virgin. And we're going to need more spaceports because more people are going to want to go. And then as more people want to go, they need more infrastructure, which is more business for everybody. And I think it's just going to have like this domino exponential growth aspect to it. Well, I'm, I'm, it's too bad that you're really not more enthusiastic about this future, but that's good. I have, rid, I have ridden the dog, and I can guarantee you that that's not the final solution to transportation. We've had some great questions come in. I'm going to work them in just a second. But before, I want to just sort of ask a general question of all of you, which is, you know, each of your endeavors comes with a lot of risk, a lot of risk. Um, well, maybe not Steve so much, but because he runs an association, and I know how that works. But anyway, the, the spaceport market, still people are putting money into it, and we think it's going to work, but we don't know. Could you just talk a little bit to the, the question of why this capability for launch or for in-space operations or for economic development actually is going to meet a need? What's the burning customer uh, or buyer need that will turn it into something successful in the long haul? And, and, and Steve Isley, let's start with you. Absolutely. So um, we say there's a lot of risk. I mean, from our perspective, the first thing we do is, I mean, we have a we have a very de-risk platform in the sense that one, we're proven technology wise. Two, you know, we propose these spaceports to go on a crawl, walk, run basis. So essentially, I mean, with us, we always are targeting airports in particular. So runways, which is, which is differentiated a lot of times from other spaceports that do have pads or need you know big uh, fields or wetlands or wherever uh, area to, to launch from, you know we can actually launch from airports that are dual use. I mean that are commercial use or military use or so forth. So there, uh, many times their primary business case is already something else than dependent on the you know uh, spaceport launch uh, 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 services. And so, you know, when we go crawl, work, run, we say, well, let's 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 grow with the market. So we can bring the equipment over to do a one-off launch campaigns. So we can lease some equipment and just bring the plane over. We can leave the equipment and a plane and bring the rocket over. We can store rockets, you know, capsulate, you know, payloads there. So you can really see how you can grow with the economy. And so that's one way that, as we talk to the spaceport groups, the governments, the investors, that they can really grow with the economy versus putting massive capex up front, uh, which of course not everyone wants to do. But more importantly to your question, like why, like what's driving the economy? Why, you know, what, what, why, why should, you know, how is the risk mitigated through the return on investment? And the simple reason is, I mean, the, the market's all about the data. And I, and I like to say like, uh, I, you know, in fact, I just talked to a new government yesterday um, uh, and, we, and, we, and we talk all over the world and we, I, I should say we have a spaceport uh, partnership in Brazil. We just announced one in, in Australia and Queensland. Uh, we have UK. Uh, we announced a logistics partnership with Luxembourg to facilitate spaceport activity around NATO nations. Um, we have a spaceport in uh, Oita, Japan. Uh, so we're really kind of tackling all different parts of the world um, to, to provide the diversity of orbits as well as, uh, you know, going where there are, there's a lot of uh, infrastructure and, uh, and uh, business that's being developed uh, from, from the space side. And the, and the similarity I'm seeing everywhere is, of course, that as the guard had said, I mean, the barriers to entry have come completely down. And so now you have uh, a lot of folks uh, from students, you know, to uh, commercial companies, to governments that are building 
data constellations. And these constellations are all for driving data. And one thing I always tell like customers, like I was talking to a new government yesterday and they said, well, but we don't have a space budget. And it's like, it's not about space. It's about data. The data is for infrastructure. The data is for maritime. The data is for agriculture. You know, go to the Department of Agriculture, go to, go to your inter interior department and look about how can we improve the roads? How can we, you know, fix the floodplains? How can, where can we put, you know, dams or shore up, you know, strategic areas that are weak points um, from, from a, you know, inclement weather perspective. And, you know, and, and you really start seeing the light bulb go off because it's not just about a space economy anymore. It's the world economy. And this is just about enabling other sensors, other capabilities, data that eventually will come down to a phone to the end user, um, whether it's a farmer or a government official or a, a boat captain. And I, and I think that's really what is changing the dynamic. And then more and more countries and communities and companies want their own data. They don't wanna wait for data to be, you know, second-handed them, you know, at some convenient time of the original operator, but rather they wanna be able to dwell over their area. They wanna be able to capture data over their nation. They wanna be able to take that data and give it to their students on a priority basis. And the only way you're going to do that is if you can have some modicum of control with the assets in space. And that is really where I think, you know, companies like mine and Nagar, that's what we're enabling. That's what we're opening up. When we say opening up for space for all, that's what we mean. It's about utilizing the data and having a piece of space that's yours and not dependent on another nation to do that. I think that's a very interesting idea. It's one I haven't heard before, but I think you've put it very, very well. I'm gonna guess everybody on this panel will agree with it, this notion that we're not talking about a space economy. We're talking about extending Earth's economy into space, right? It all becomes integrated. Steve, let's let's get that same answer from you. So now you've got this, you know, we talked a little bit about economic diversity, but each one of your members has to make a bunch of decisions about what the customer's real need is in their local market for a spaceport and then decide, you know, how much how much to invest into that, basically. What what are you advising them? Right, I mean, what we'd like to say is that there are no two spaceports are exactly alike. So they all have slightly different profiles, um, but they all have to justify the investment, right? And so uh, in many cases, the municipalities are being, are, are the governments are supporting these, these communities. They have to be justified. They have to have investors that are lined up. They have to have a, ser a, 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 a serious business plan lined up, and they have to then go through all the hoops, if you will, at the FAA to get the proper licensing, uh, which includes um, environmental assessments and so forth. Um, and they have to deal with, um, especially if it's, especially if it's vertical launch, they have to deal with the communities around those facilities because there's there's they're concerned about the noise and the environmental impact and so forth. This is where maybe air launched vehicles have a slight have a slight edge in in, in that in terms of in terms of adoption. So there's um there, there's cl there's clear risks, um, but they see as as uh, as Stephen was saying that there is a real opportunity um, uh, to sort of rebound a little, continue a little bit what St Stephen is getting at, is the, these constellations, especially when you're talking about low Earth orbit constellation satellites, um, we're transitioning from the big giant bus size satellites to small um, box size, you know, box size satellites, CubeSats they're called. Um, and these are, are essentially disposable, they're replaceable. And so how do we replace them? Well, they need, they need launch services. So you're sort of you're sort of building in this this launch uh, demand over, over time. You know, I'm I'm just uh, just thinking more about Nagar's comment about you know you you create this demand and um, you know it, it you create this capacity and it only especially at a, at a lower and lower price point, all it does is create additional demand. I remember when they were building, I, I'm in New York, so when they were building the um, uh, the Tribor Bridge. You know, under uh, 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 Robert Moses, right? They they said, "Oh, we can't. What are we going to do with this giant bridge? Six planes? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, gonna, we know we, we know how that works. Enough, yeah. There's not going to be enough cars. You know, and we, we know how that works with highways. Years. If you if you build it, they'll fill. Yeah, exactly. Steve, I'm, I'm just interested. In time. I'm just going to move on because you already introduced yeah, Nagar. Nagar. So so I, if you could be, I mean, I, I 
I think we all get your vision of, of, the, of the demand cycle as it's supposed to work, but what, what specific kinds of applications are you expecting to see to help drive your business? So, you know, going back to also an earlier question you had about um, what are the customer needs we're trying to meet, um, there is like a whole plethora of industries here on Earth that we have that haven't been able to go to space yet. Why? they didn't have, you know, responsive, fast access to space, like Steve was saying earlier, you know, they couldn't call you up and within a day or two, you know, go to space. And for certain applications like biological payloads or other industries, you need that type of access. You need to be able to take things up fast, like if you're carrying an embryo or something like that. You know, you can't encapsulate like a Falcon 9 three months in advance and you know, wait for a couple months until it's in orbit. So in terms of like industries that we're going to see grow going into space, it's expanding the access to all the other industries that were limited because of the transportation modes available. You know, uh, it, I've been working in the space industry for 18 years, and I can't even tell you how many times customers are like, no, I, I, you know, I need to encapsulate like hours before launch, I have a very sensitive payload, it's not going to work. So I think that industry of sensitive, precious payloads that need to go to space and need to come back in a very timely fashion is what's going to, you're going to see grow really fast. And then another area that I'm seeing a lot of growth in is in the mining and heavy industries. You know, um, there are a lot of you know, problems we have here on earth, you know, we have energy crisis right now, we have, you know, that are led by, you know, caused by a lot of, you know, um, socioeconomic global problems, like, you know, the war in Ukraine, etc. Um, and they're very dirty industries. And as as we, you know, kind of keep on going along the path we're going, we're going to run out of resources here on earth. And space has a ton of resources, as we've seen, a lot of water, abundant energy, power all the time. If we could run a lot of these heavy industries in space, we would be like miles ahead. And what you need in order to enable that is space transportation, both in space and earth to space back and forth, because you can't develop things and build factories in space and then not have a way to get the stuff back down to earth. Or even if you're doing, that's like earth for space applications. So it's also space for space applications. So that's a whole new market that doesn't exist today. And it's gonna be huge, for example, if you put up one satellite and, you know, it's hard to, you know, take really big solar arrays, et cetera, you put another power generating source and you beam the power from one to the other, you know, that's one example of space for space and an industry that can flourish and exist in space. And I, I don't know, the list is endless and I don't want to. Okay. Well, that's, that's, that's good because we don't, we don't have endless time. All right, so now it's our audience's turn. Um, some interesting questions. I'm going to stick with you, Nagar, for just a moment because there were two specific one, a very interesting one. Uh, and here's, it reads this way. Do you expect more complexity with balloon launches compared to aircraft launch due to the longer time for the balloon to go up and down and crossing controlled airspace? Is, you know, how does this actually impact in practical terms your ability to launch from anywhere? Actually, so that's the key. If if you remember when I talked about the beginning about autonomy and AI and having those capabilities now in the technology, we've actually implemented that into our uh, balloon carrier. So we have the high altitude balloon. It's just a typical high altitude balloon, but we have a rider. Um, it's it's called a spider, uh, which basically carries the rocket. Yeah. It has propellers and stuff on board. <laughs> As you say, it's a good name. That's what I thought of when I saw it. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so it looks like a little spider. It carries our rocket on there. And that actually is controlled autonomously and uses AI to calculate on board what orientation we need to put the rocket in order to hit the uh, orbit, whatever custom orbit our customer wants in space. So we can move it around using this rider to wherever we need. So, you know, we can go up over land, move it over the ocean, launch from there, et cetera. And we have the capability to orient it and do everything autonomously, which will also enable deep space transportation because we have a lot of problems right now going to the moon and beyond because of communications and other things. So if you have vehicles that can operate autonomously, that solves that problem too. Now, now just hang on a second though, because you, you, you said something there that I'm having a little 
difficulty getting my arms around. You know, once you launch that balloon, you really can't control where it goes, can you? No, we have. I said we have a control system. Well, you, you can rotate. You can rotate which direction you face underneath your balloon, but the balloon is being driven by the wind someplace, right? Yeah, but we we have um, an engine on board with propeller. Ah, okay. I that think was of an airplane piece. with the propeller spinning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the, yeah, they were called dirigibles back in the old days. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay, so just a, here's a very specific question, just a short answer if you would. Um, somebody asked about Space Ride Warkworth Groundworks Facility stopped operation on October 7. This is all news to me due to uh, con community concern. You know, does Space Ride have plans to build a groundwork center elsewhere? And I don't, I have no idea what I just said, just so you know. So go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's actually. Um been been some press about that and we've been able to actually manage that with the local community so we actually own and operate our own ground test facility in canada and um we have voluntarily um stopped some of our testing for a period of time which does not affect our long-term um, trajectory for launch we did the testing we needed we test periodically um, and we um, may or may not open additional ground test facilities. Um, but that's really all I can tell you. Um, it's basically um, fine. We, you know, we have the data we need in order to support our first launch, which is planned for uh, mid- And then in 2024, we have additional launches. And they're all sold out, which is great. Um, makes my job. Congratulations, easy. that's great. So yeah, everything's well, okay yeah. in terms of our testing facility, and we will potentially expand beyond what we have today. Um, well, you know that, and that's great. I mean, the community gets to gets to voice as well, right? That's part of part of the value. Steve Isley, let me just turn over to you for a moment. A couple of interesting questions. Um, one was about nations that you choose to invest or deploy services in do you have criteria like geopolitical interest capability needs level of other commercial space investment etc or is it you know their customers and, and you go where the customer is yeah uh lori uh, that is a great question um so uh, we definitely do have criterion i mean base level of course is looking at the spaceport and the runway um, need to have some basic infrastructure and apron. There has to be a keep out zone that you can have some clearances, uh, especially when you're when you're at L minus um, three uh, going forward to the launch. Um, we prefer proximity to water, to the ocean in particular, or at least a channel where we can fly over. Um, the, the beauty of an air launch system is we drop over the oceans. So that minimizes a lot of the uh, population overflight concerns. Uh, any of the risks. So we do the E sub C analysis that looks at rocket trajectory. It's always ocean bound. I mean, technically we can, we could launch over land if we got clearance, but that's not our goal because it just makes things a lot easier. So proximity to water runway um, is another uh, key one. And then of course, absolutely. We look at the, we look at the country, we look at the, the launching site. I mean, it's important that the nation um, have already, or is at least investing in uh, growing their space-based capability. I think if we went in and there was, you know, nothing there and, 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 you know, and frankly, sometimes nations or spaceports, they're like, well, we'll lease you all of our area. You know, you pay us money and bring all the customers. And really we want to be in a more collaborative relationship. We want to be in a partnership where you have more local, um, you know, space, uh, activity. UK is a great example of that. I mean, the UK has, uh, you know, I think over 10 small set manufacturers, they have a robust university system uh, where there's a lot of payloads coming out. They have, you know, they've got different space clusters like in Harwell. Um, they have, you know, obviously a, 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 a strong uh, a government uh, backing a lot of that industry, both on the civil agency side as well as the defense side. So those are all things that we look at. Um, there's also regulatory issues. I mean, to be a spacefaring nation, uh, as it stands today, you need to be part of MTCR, so Missile Technology Control Regime uh, list for the export of, of rocket technology. Um, now that, uh, you know, the, 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 there could be some other options, some bilateral options there to engage, but ultimately those are, the, those are the first things that I look at. 
And then beyond that, you've got, of course, your sub checklist. Um, I mean, you want it to be viable. You want it to, uh, you know, having a payload processing facility, things like that are nice to have, but not must have. So there, there is a, a lot under consideration. And, and you may also notice we targeted kind of spaceports on every continent. Um, you know, I'm, I still, I would love to have a spaceport in the African continent as well. That's the one we'll be missing. Um, and, but soon, hopefully, uh, we will be able to engage there. And, um, you know, so geopolitically, it's good to be spread out and diverse. Uh, and also, naturally, we look at partnering with allies. We want to be with natural partners, uh, whether it's Five Eyes, NATO, Quad, et cetera, uh, so that we can leverage uh, each other's uh, industry and collaborate. And this is really about making it a global collaborative effort and not just be about that individual country or about us as a company, frankly. Hmm. Very interesting. Wow. Kind of a long way from Cape Canaveral sitting there watching. I was just giving a speech recently. I was talking, asking people if they remembered where they were on, on July 20 of 1969. And I was surprised by the number of people who knew what I was talking about and raised their hands. <laughs> of course, it was Neil Armstrong's first walk on the moon. Slightly different proposition. Um, we're getting low on time. So I want to turn to my final question, uh, some of which we've covered. But uh, frankly, every, every time you guys answer a question, you're, <laughs> I learn twice as much as I thought I was going to learn. Ultimately, why does it matter if a nation serves as a launch site for access to space today? I mean, of course, they had, you know, bragging rights are great. National pride is great. But what are, the, what are the meaningful impacts as far as you're concerned on people, on the economy, and on their future? And let's, let's start with Steve Wolf. Yeah, I think, I think your answer to your question is in the question in that um, Company, uh, countries are looking for ways where they can leverage uh, uh, and, and build economic strength internally. Um, fortunately, you know, investment in space has been the fastest growing investments category uh, for, for several years now. So there is a recognition that this is a, a growth sector. And, uh, and, and, and all of that 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 implies in terms of innovation, in terms of, in terms of the, the technology, in terms of being at the, the, the front of, of economic development, um, it's, it's extremely enticing. You know, there was an adage, there, there was an adage uh, that said, uh, I think a SpaceX person said it, all companies are space companies, they just don't know it yet. And I would probably, I'd probably expand that to say all countries are space countries, they don't know it yet. That's where we're getting to. Um, and, uh, you know, every country is trying to find their niche in this, in this sector, whether they're going to have a spaceport. Uh, we, see, we see country after country that have traditionally not had any, any involvement in space, standing up space agencies wanting to making investment big and small into these into the sector. Uh, so there is a global recognition and it really is all about driving the economy, driving the potential for jobs, driving the, the potential to you know, elevate the country into higher and higher levels. And you know, I think that's that's the beginning and the end of it. Steve Isley, what's your what's your view on that? I mean, why ultimately does it matter? This thing that you're talking about, being able to fly over to the UK and and help them make their first launch from British soil. Um, and everything Steve Wolf said was spot on, and and that is definitely part of my answer. But I mean, in short, um, if you're a country, India, China, United States, Russia, France, the French Guiana, those are your options for the most part. So what do you do? I mean, if you're going to be part of this new economy. I mean, do you need to, you know, I, I mean, would, would we tolerate not having airports in our backyard? Uh, would we want to travel, to, you know, to the next nation or next big city to, to go catch an airplane? I mean, I think we're getting to the point where this is really an open economy and every country is a spacefaring nation. Uh, and, and, and whether they know it or not, but they do know it because they benefit from space directly or indirectly. And so we're making that direct connect. So we're, we're taking out the middleman, so to speak, and we're letting countries control their own destiny keep you know keep it confidential keep it on their schedule and keep it within their uh, economy and i think that's really important i mean jobs obviously is the number one topic on any politician's mind but it's also number one you know piece that's important for any economy to grow Absolutely. and so i think that potential that growth is why you do it or you'll be left behind it's that simple and i think nations are realizing that 
Well, yes. Nagar, last word to you in terms of this. Why ultimately does it matter that a particular place gets to gets to be a launch site? Um, I, I think from a practical perspective, it's like priority. If you think about historically, you know, um, Canadians were, you know, just because we're a Canadian company, I got to put a plug in there. Yeah, they were of course. Building, uh, satellites much earlier than the Chinese were. But if you look at the number of satellites that the Chinese have launched today versus the number that the Canadian have launched, the Chinese number of satellites to orbit are far outweigh those of the Canadians. And it's primarily because of the access problem, right? The, the Canadians launch on US rockets or French rockets or Indian rockets or something like that. And they don't get priority to get their stuff to space. Plus the pricing structure and everything else I'm sure is different. So I think an access, which we've brought up multiple times is important. But I think the key here that we haven't brought up yet is inspiring the next generation. You know, what, what did putting man on the moon do for everybody? You know, um, it inspired a whole generation of people to want to go to space and build economies in space and everything like that. So having more nations that are space faring basically amplifies the funnel of people inspired to come into this industry. This is a problem we have. I mean, every space company I've worked for has always had problems with recruitment and not just with recruitment, but retaining talent. So the more countries that have more access to space, the more that funnel of talent will grow and the more people will be inspired to take more industries to space. And I think inspiration is, is the key word here. Well, all I can say is you're right. I've been waiting 50 years for this stuff. So can you, the three of you, please get with it, please? In a couple of months. <laughs> we'll launch out of the UK in uh, a month, so. Oh, I know. No, I'm just, just I'm just joshing. Uh, listen, thanks very, very much, um, Steve Isley, Steve Wolf, and Nagar Ferrer for, for this. I walked away knowing three as I well probably four times more than I knew about this before so thank you personally and I'm sure our audience feels the way feels the same way um if you could just put up our share again just put up our, our slide there just to, very briefly for all you folks coming up from SSPI and I'm sure that slide's going to appear at any moment there it is December, we're going to be in London uh, having our Better Satellite World Awards dinner on December 6th. If you're in that region, in that vicinity, I highly recommend it. It's a great evening as well as a great opportunity to network with both business and government people. Our nominations for the Space and Satellite Hall of Fame open on the same day, December 6th. And we will also be releasing later in December a new Better Satellite World video on Water Wars, which is one of the more compelling ones I think we've done. January, February of 2023, more, more videos coming out, including one about smarter mining. Uh, Nagar talked about AI uh, in space. Well, this is about AI in the ground made possible and enabled by space. And the beginning of a new campaign, Bridging the Broadband Gap, which is underwritten by Hughes, and that'll be kicking off on January 24th. And finally, in uh, March, a satellite will be holding our invitation-only Hall of Fame celebration for the sea level of the industry. So we look forward to greeting them there. So next slide, please. And just to say thank you to all, all who joined us. Uh, again, this will be available in recorded form in a few days. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a very interesting hour. So thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We're going to be shutting down the Zoom. So thank you so much for your participation. Thank you. OK, thank you. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, a very happy thank Thanksgiving you, for all of you Americans in the audience. Cheers. Cheers.